Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I have yet to see a day that wasn't a beautiful day to worship God. Because even when the day stinks, <laughs> literally, literally. And I walked in this morning and I thought there were a whole bunch of people in here smoking cigarettes last night. Uh, hmm, what kind of fellowship meeting did we have that I didn't attend? Um, for those of you that were praying for Thaddeus, thank you. Uh, the procedure went very well. Um, we had this plan for about two months, Friday, before the procedure, we get a call from the surgeon's office saying uh, the insurance is denying this claim, they won't pay for it. So that caused a flurry of calls between Spokane, Missoula, our house, and wherever the insurance people are. I have an idea in mind where they might be, but I'm not going to say it here. <laughs> um, so essentially what ended up happening is there needed to be a conference call between certain people at the insurance and certain people, our doctors and, and things like that, explaining why it was necessary for Thaddeus to go to Spokane to have this procedure done. Um, that took place 9 o'clock-ish Wednesday morning. We had to leave by 11 o'clock Wednesday morning. So um, about, it was about 10.30 we got the call that it's a go. And so we boogied out to the truck and, and we took off. Uh, the procedure took quite a bit longer than they were expecting. I think it was a good thing because the surgeon was incredibly meticulous. Um, he thinks that he was able to correct the problem, that he should have no more problems here on out with a raising heart, at least until he meets a girl. <laughs> and, and, and the surgeon said he can't fix that. <laughs> I said, I can think of a couple ways to fix that, but none of them are legal. <laughs> so, so thank you for praying. Everything went well. Um, God had his hand on us. Uh, it, was, it was a blessed trip all around, so thank you. Um, I haven't asked the pastor question that was submitted a couple weeks ago, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. Okay. So... In Matthew 7, 22, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And in Luke 9, 49 and 50, John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said to him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Okay, so you, you got that, right? Okay. Hold on to that, because we're going for a ride on a tilt world <laughs> Why would Satan empower someone to cast out his own evil spirit, as in Luke uh, 11, 14 through 20, and Matthew 12, 22 through 30? So how in Matthew 7, 22, can Jesus say he never knew them? Is it because of the power of the name of Jesus, one can cast out a demon even if they're not saved. Uh, but the non-saved are, are working for the devil. I hope you can answer, understand my question. Did you guys understand it? Because okay. I'm, I'm going to answer with what I understood the question to be. <clears throat> So in Matthew 7, 22, uh, we actually find two parallel scripture passages, and I'll, I'll touch on the other one later. Um, in Matthew 7, 22, Jesus is talking about those that will come before him, and having done the signs and wonders, they are not known by him. Okay? Um, later, when the disciples see people performing these, these wonders... They, they go to Jesus and say, hey, we took care of this for you. Like, Jesus needed people to take care of stuff for him. And he says, no, don't, don't stop them, because if they're not opposing us, if they're not against us, they are for us. Okay, so the, the dilemma comes in. How in the world do unbelievers exhibit the miraculous powers that true believers should exhibit? 
Well, there's a couple of answers. First, uh, the question was even partially answered here, is it because there's power in the name? There is absolutely power in the name of Jesus. Uh, the, the scriptures replete with examples of there being power in the name of Jesus. Um, John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Uh, Luke 10, 17, the 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Um, Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted on him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, now there are, there are numerous other examples. There is power in the name of Jesus. Okay. However, we have a couple of examples where um, that power, the, the power in the name of Jesus, didn't quite work out that way. Um, after the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus and uh, James, John, and Peter, they go up on the mountain and, and Jesus is transfigured and he speaks with Moses and Elijah and, and Peter's like, hey, you want us to build you a you know, little, little refuge here, a little tent thing so you guys will be sheltered? It would be good for us to do so. And, and, and uh, Jesus says no. And, and they come down from the mountain and they come down off of this mountain. And what do they run into? Uh, it's interesting because all three of the synoptic gospels, you guys know what synoptic gospels are? Okay, the, the, they're the three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that move in union. They, they, they build upon each other. They, they tell a lot of the same stories. John is unique from the other three in that his focus is a little bit different in the things that he tells. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is, if you look at them, all three of them have a large percentage of their, their, their parables and the miracles are the same from one to the other. Okay, so the, the synoptic gospels. Um, all three of the synoptic gospels say that when Jesus comes down off the Mount of Transfiguration, he comes to chaos. He comes to a problem. It, there's a man who has brought his son, who is demon-possessed, he's brought him to the disciples, and the disciples aren't able to help him. And, and um, you know, the, then the religious leaders get involved, and they're shouting back and forth, and, and, and there's disputation. And Jesus comes down, and he says, well, what is going on? And, and the, the man with the son comes to him, and he, and he tells him what the problem is. I, I, I brought my son to be healed, and, and, and it will come on him, and it will seize him, and he'll foam at the mouth, and it, it'll cast him in the fire and try to hurt him. And, and I brought him, and your disciples were not able to deliver him. And now, these are the same disciples that not very long before, they were part of the 72 that Jesus sent out. And I, I read that passage. Um, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Matter of fact, I want to I turn there. Um, you have your Bible. We're going to flip over to uh, Luke 49. 49. No. You're not going to find that in Luke. Was it Luke? Uh, I just had it. 9. Chapter 9. If your Bible has a Luke 49, you need to turn it in. Okay, so in Luke chapter 9, verse 49, okay, the 72 have gone out, they've returned. <clears throat> um, wait a minute, this isn't the passage that I want. All right, give me a sec. Hold, please. Somebody want to play some music? <laughs> Elevator style. Well, that's 
just odd. Anybody else hearing the Jeopardy theme song? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so the 72 go out. Yes, that's it. Loop 10, thank you. Chapter 10, flip over a page. So Luke 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Okay? But the story doesn't stop there, does it? Okay? Because in verse 18, he says, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Verse 20. Nevertheless. Okay? That's an important article there. That's, that's important because he has said something, and, and now he's all, not eliminating it, but almost discounting it. Okay? Because what comes next is more important. It says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay? Because, see, we're all about the end game. Right? Our faith is based on the end game. Because we know that at some point in the future, there is an end to all of this. Okay? To this life, to the, the chaos, the sin, the confusion, the, the, the just the ick. Okay? We understand that that's all coming to an end. There is a, a clock up in heaven that God has set. And when that hour strikes, everything will change. Okay? So I, I think what Jesus is reminding them is don't get so caught up in this that you forget what this is about. Okay, Don't get so caught up in the circumstances that you forget about the end game. We, we all do it. We all get caught up in the moment. We all get caught up in seasons of life. But he's reminding us our joy should come from the fact that our names are written in heaven. That we know the end of the story. Okay, so coming back to our question, there are two things that I believe are going on with this question. The first is there is power in the name of Jesus. But beyond that, why would Jesus let someone who is not a believer have power in his name to cast out demons and, and, and to prophesy and do, to do miraculous things? Well, who's getting on? Jesus. Jesus is. And I think that's part of what that statement is, is, is you you got to remember, um, I don't care how many demons you drive out. I don't care how many diseases you heal. I don't care about all of these things because if your heart is not with me, then I don't know you. And these things may happen and His name may be glorified, but ultimately... They're out of the end game. Okay, so, so what's the second part of this? The second part of this, we got to jump way back into the Old Testament for a moment. So if you would, let me, let me make sure I've got my passage here before I tell you to turn. Uh, flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 13. I've got to set something up for you because we're going to look way back and then we're going to look forward. I apologize. When I do the ask the pastor questions, I don't write the answers the way I do my sermons. When I do my sermons, I have all of the scriptures marked with bold and with highlighter so I can get quick reference. 
in here they're kind of tucked away in a paragraph because when I answer your question, you want to read it as though I'm speaking to you, not as a bunch of bullet points and, and notes that mean nothing to you. So um, we're going to look back in Deuteronomy chapter 13. We're also going to look a little bit in chapter 18. So Deuteronomy 13. Verse 1, it says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. So, so catch what he's saying right here. A prophet has arisen. He has spoken forth something, and that something happened. Okay? So, so you know there's power operating here. But, but look what follows next says, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God. Okay, so now let's flip over real quick to chapter 18 because we're going to see another part of this. So... Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to jump down to verse 15. Um, actually, I'm going to skip down a little bit further for the sake of brevity. Um, verse 18 says, I will raise, I being God, will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name I myself will require it of him. So this is a little side note. Keep, keep a hold of this because if God speaks to you, he's expecting a response from you. Okay? Now if you're not sure it's God, don't just let it drop. Put it someplace safe where you will remember it, where you'll keep it fresh and wait to see. Okay? If, if it doesn't come to pass, you have not lost anything. If it does come to pass, you're ready. You're prepared. Okay? So, but in verse 20, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, How may we know that the, the word that the Lord has uh, not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of it. So see, there's two things that are going on in these two passages. Both of them dealing with prophets or workers of miracles, workers of signs. The first is, if, if they're, they're not in line with God, you'll know because it's not going to come to pass. Okay? And, and you're not to be afraid of that person and the things that they say. Now, here's the dilemma that we run into. Okay? When Jeremiah spoke many of his prophecies, when Isaiah spoke many of his prophecies, they did not come to fruition in the life of the listener. They did not come to fruition in the life of the prophet. Okay? So, if, if their word doesn't come true, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not from God. It may mean that it's not for this time. Just like the virgin birth. The, the, the prophet spoke that the, the, the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And that didn't happen until some 400 plus years later. Okay? But, but the first condition being, if they're not from God, it's not going to come true. So if, if it doesn't come true, don't worry about it. Just let it go. But the, the second one is a little bit more difficult because sometimes... The things they do, do happen, and they do come true. What do we do with that? Well, then you look at the intent of the speaker. Because if the intent of the speaker is to point you in any direction other than God, they're bad. It's false. It's a lie. 
Now, you go, well, what does this have to do with the original question? The, the point I want to make is this. Uh, in the Old Testament, we saw that people had power to accomplish things that were not necessarily of God. Okay? Remember Balaam. Uh, Balaam, the Israelites are coming into Israel. Balak goes and he says, I want you to come and speak a word, a prophecy over these people and, and rebuke them and, and have horrible things come on them so they won't take away my kingdom. And, and Balaam goes and, and he starts to prophesy, but he prophesies blessing instead of curse. And, and Balaam goes, what are you doing? Hey, man, I'm paying you for this. And he says, what can I say but what God gives me to say? So well, 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 come around over here to this spot so you can see the whole army, the whole people of them. Maybe then you can curse them. So they go around to this spot. He opens his mouth and he blesses them again. And Balak's like, dude, this is not what I'm paying for. Now, we see kind of the end of the story there, but we know later Balaam does something a little bit different because Balaam reiterated at least three times that I cannot speak other than what God would give me to speak. But he did do something else, didn't he? Because we find out later in Scripture that Balaam would not speak a word against Israel, but he did speak to Balak and he said, this is what you need to do. You want to ruin these people. Give your daughters in marriage to them. And let your sons marry their daughters. And, and see, this is one of the things that God told Israel when he went in. He said, you go in you are to expunge the land of these people. You are not to give your daughters to their sons. You are not to take their daughters for your sons. Because if you do so, they will sway you. They will lull you. They will pull you into worship of these false gods. And we see that's exactly what happened. And it's pointed right back to Balaam. Scripture says it was Balaam that, that put this idea into the, the mind of Balak and all of the other people. Hey, well, hey give them your daughters. And, and let your sons marry their daughters and, and intermingle with them and, and then you'll see. Okay, so Balaam, who was used of God because he said, hey, point blank, I, I can't say but other than what God gives me to say. He had some kind of power going on there. Okay? But he's cursed. Now let's jump over to the New Testament. Luke, uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. There's a couple things I want to point out to you here real quick. And I'm going to try and tie this all together with a, another set of scriptures here real quick. <clears throat> I'm trying to shorten this up a little, a little bit for you. Um, Jesus is talking about the signs of the end of the age. We're, we're going to run down all the way to... Um, Verse 21, okay, says, uh, For there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. Okay? Now watch this, verse 24. For false Christs, or, or in some translations it's antichrists, and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now catch that for a minute. You see what he's saying? There are going to be those who are not of God who are going to come with the sole purpose of drawing you away, leading you off, and they're going to have power to do signs and wonders. Okay? So, um, if possible, even the elect. Now, now there's one thing that, that I take comfort in. Okay? Because, man, I, I've seen some very devious and cunning heresy get woven into doctrine. And... and one of those things that God promises us that when we are His, He will keep us safe. Whom I have taken in my hand, none can shake loose. Okay, but there are a lot of people in the church today that are uh, cultural Christians. They, they have not had the Spirit indwell them. 
They, they do not have the Spirit of God living in them. They are not sealed unto Him. They've made a conscious decision, but, but they have not lived it out in their lives. They've not allowed God to transform them, to do that miraculous transformation from the old and the dead to the new and living. Okay? So, their purpose is to lead people astray. And then in uh, verse 25, he says, See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness. Do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures were gathered. Okay, so we see in the Old Testament, God was warning them about the false prophets, the false workers of miracles. We, we see in the New Testament, Jesus is looking to the end times and he says, these people are coming. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know now, they're coming. And they're going to have things that are making you going to go, oh. It says, um, they will perform great signs and wonders. Okay, so one last passage. Um, I want to flip over to Revelation. Let me get there real quick. Um, oops. 14. 14? Not 14. 13. <clears throat> Okay, so now we're looking even further into the future. Okay, because I, I believe the, the part that we just read, I believe that's happening today. Okay, and I think it will, will become more and more pronounced as we draw closer to, to the end times. Um, verse 11. Um, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Now look at verse 13. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Okay, so, so we, we have some other things that are going, but what, what I want you to pick up here, do you remember in the ministry of Jesus what the, what the Pharisees, what the religious leaders kept asking him? One of the things that they asked numerous times is, show us a sign. And, and Jesus responds to them. He says, no sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah. Okay? Because he knew uh, they're, they're being witness to the, the miraculous things that he's doing. Matter of fact, at one point they even say, well, you know, it's by the power of Beals above the prince of demons that he heals and, and, and casts out demons. And Jesus responds to him. He says, well, will a house divided against itself stand? How then if I am casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, how do you cast out demons? Okay? So, so we understand that people are impressed with signs. Okay? I think that's a good thing. Because when, when somebody has God move in their lives, you don't want to sit there humdrum and go, oh, Good for you. I mean, when, when God does a miracle in somebody's life, that's something to praise God for. That's something to rejoice together with the person about. Okay? So it's something we're aware of, but we got to keep it in the right position. Okay? Because if the sign points us to praise and worship and, and, and glory to God and it draws us closer to God and, and moves us on the path to God, all well and good. But if in any way it detracts from that, if in any way it sways you, it, it turns your attention from God, there's trouble. Okay? So the, the, the first component of this, this question, there's power in the name, but the second component of this question is the enemy has power too. He has power that we don't really get because we're not 
like them. Okay? We, we don't really understand how that whole thing works. And I, I earnestly believe with all of my heart that the enemy can do great and powerful things, but only in so much as God allows. In all of this, did you catch when I read back about the, the false prophet earlier? When God said they come to you and, and they do the miracles and what they say comes to pass, and then they say, let's go follow other gods. Did you catch what I read down a little bit later? Why did that happen? God allowed it because he was testing them to see that they would hold true. Okay. Now, does God really not know? Does God not know whether or not you're going to stand firm? Is he surprised when you stumble? No, he knows all things. So who is the test really for? It's for us. It's for us that we might be discerners of truth. Okay? So if the enemy has power and if God has given him reign to use that power such that it would, if possible, even deceive the elect. Okay? What is the end result? For the church, not much. The true church is going to see right through this. Because we're going to be looking to the pointers. We're going to be looking for that sign that is directing us toward God or away from God. And, and we're going to have this huge red light going off. Bam, 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 bam. Danger. Don't go here. Okay? The true church is not going to be drawn into that. Okay? So when these people work these signs and wonders and they come to Jesus. Now, I honestly believe that in some measure they believe that they knew Jesus. Because otherwise they said, why would they call him Lord? Why would they call him Lord? So why were they empowered to do these things? First, because I believe it gave Jesus glory. Scripture says that at his name, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. The, the whole result of all of creation is to give God glory. Okay, So if it's going to give God glory, I think God says, okay. But, what is the difference when they stand before him? Well, the difference, if we look over in Matthew 25, Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats. You guys can look that up a little bit later. Jesus talks about the separating of the sheep and the goats. And, and he says to the goats, he says, I didn't know you. And, and when I was hungry and thirsty, you gave me nothing to eat and nothing to drink. And when, when I was sick and I was in prison, you didn't come and visit me. You didn't do these things. What is the difference between a true believer and a non-believer? A true believer is changed from the inside out so that they have the same heart as Christ. Whether or not I ever lay hands on somebody and heal them of anything. Okay? I don't stand before God and He says, well, how many miracles did you work? None. <laughs> well, okay. Maybe, you know, that wasn't your thing. Maybe, how many demons did you cast out? None. <laughs> well, how many prophecies did you give? Do you have anything more like the sweeping and mopping area? <laughs> because, see, that's really what it's about. Because, see, the signs and wonders might gain you esteem here on this planet. But before God, He's looking for a broken heart. He's looking for a repentant heart. He's looking for a heart that presses in hard after Him that is willing to lay down all the broken pieces and say, remake me however you would. Okay? So when, when we stand before him, he's going to see what that, that, that heart that was wrought, what that brought out in your life. Because more and more and more and more, your life will begin to reflect his. Okay? See, that's, that's the true nature of a Christian. Because you look in 1 Corinthians, okay? Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. Chapter 12 talks about the gifts of the spirits and, and how the, the spirit uh, gives as the spirit will and, and all of these different things that are going on. And, and, and chapter 14 goes into the proper use of certain aspects of these gifts. But stuck right in the middle of that is chapter 13. And that's the key part. Because when Paul starts, he tags right off the end of 12 and he says, but now I'm going to show you a better way. Look, I've talked about all the gifts. I've talked about all the cool stuff that goes on in church. You know, you get the Holy Ghost bumps. When something happens and you go, Ooh. what? Okay. But, but then he says, now I will show you the better way. 
Okay, I will show you the better way. And the better way goes right into, if I, man, if I can work all these miracles, but I don't have love, it's, it's of no value. Man, if, if I can speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm, I'm just a clangy gong. You know, I, I like to picture the pot. Clunk, 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 clunk. You guys do that on New Year's Eve? <laughs> I used to. I found out that Christy doesn't like loud noises at that time of the morning. And so I don't anymore. But if, if, if I have not love, then it doesn't matter how many languages I speak, whether of man or of angel, I don't have love. And see, see, what he says is, look, these things are good and they're appropriate and they're necessary. But the better thing is, rather than the working of signs and wonders and miracles and prophecies, have love. Have love. Because all of these other things, one day they're going to be gone. One day it's going to be all over with because there will be no sickness. You will be in the presence of God and you won't need to know the future because every day is going to be in the presence of God. So there will be no sickness, there will be no disease, there will be no need for prophecies. However, these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. Now, faith and hope, I believe at that time, we will, they will be fulfilled. We will see what we hope in. We will see the result of our faith. But love, we will be in the manifest presence of love. Can you imagine that? Now, I, I, I struggle with the concept of love. Okay, I tend to reduce it to, for me, love is loyalty. Okay, you stick with the person you love. Okay? I, I don't get a lot of the emotionalism that goes with that. Um, for a long time, that really bothered me. But you know what? God made me the way that I am. And he is teaching me how he loves. Okay? It's not so much because, you know, I, I look at certain things and, and I, oh, you know, I, I look at these newlyweds and, I, you know, like Nick and Hannah, and they look at each other with these big puppy eyes. And they're so in love. And I think, wait for six months. <laughs> wait for the first time he passes gas. Okay? Wait for the first time she wakes up in the morning and the makeup is not there and the hair is all, and she's got morning breath. Okay? And, and those puppy eyes begin to get narrower and narrower until they end up like this. You know? Okay? So I, I look at that and I go, you, you know, there's a reality to love because, you know, there, there is eros. There is that attraction and there should be that attraction. But, but the love God is calling us to, even beyond the, the love of brothers and, and the love of family and the love of friends, is the agape love. And, and that's the kind of love where it's not dependent on how well you please me. Mm -hmm. it, it's not dependent on you looking how I think you should look or acting how I think you should act or doing like I think you should do. It's completely dependent on me loving you regardless mm -hmm. because that's the love he has for us. Without his love, we would not know how to love. It's not based on their ability to be and do. So what is the end result of this? When, when that day comes and, and Jesus separates out the sheep and the goats, he's not going to be asking them, how many miracles did you do? How many prophetic signs or words did you give that came to pass? Uh, how many demons did you cast out? He's not going to look at those things. He's going to look at what you did with the heart of Christ. How did that transform your life? How did you become less like you and more like me. Those are the things that he is looking for in this life. So getting back to our question. One, because I believe absolutely there's power in the name of Jesus. Two, because I believe the enemy also has power. We have a little statement that we wrote out at home <clears throat> a couple years ago when we were going through a tough time. It was just simple truths. The first one is, uh, God is strong. The second one is, the devil is strong. He's stronger than me, but not stronger than God. Okay, and we need to rest there. I love those songs that we were singing this morning because they all talked about how our God is powerful. It, it's not about us. It's not about my ability to accomplish anything. It's about my ability to let him do it through me or to me. Okay, so, so when, when these people are coming before him and they're standing there saying, well, didn't we do this and didn't we do that and didn't we do the other? And he goes... I didn't know you. What's the important question then? Man, they came with a whole deck of cards to play. But they were playing with the wrong deck. You know? And, and when, when they turned over their last card, Jesus looked at them and said, yeah, 
You got nothing because I don't know you. So how did they work these things? One, I think under the glory of God. Two, I think possibly through the power of the enemy. And I think it's a responsibility of the church. That, that means of us. To be discerners of truth. Okay, we have the Spirit of God living in us. Okay? The Scripture tells us, man, that when we came to salvation, stamp. The Spirit was given to us as a, a seal of our salvation. Okay? He is here to teach us. He's here to counsel us. He's here to direct us. Okay? So, if that Spirit is living in us, regardless of what we see, if we will actually listen to that Spirit, and He starts doing this, what? Something's not right here. Something's off here. Now, you don't have to be a theologian to feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a doctorate in, in biblical studies or, or doctrine or theology to feel the Spirit of God prompting you and saying, hey, don't go here. Okay? Because all those degrees are going to be like those signs and wonders. When, they, when I stand before God, He's not going to ask me, well, how far did you progress in your higher learning? Because the higher education that we get here is radically different than the higher learning that God wants us to learn, isn't it? Because He wants us to learn, learn to be more like Him. Now, that's not to diminish in any way going deeper in your studies. I, I think often that I'm, I would like to go back to school. I would like to be more proficient in biblical languages. I, 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 that's something that I feel my heart... I would like to, and, and someday I will probably do. But I do that not because that's going to draw me any closer to God. It's not going to mark me with kudos before God. Oh, wow! You went back and got your master? Wow! You're like, this seat is for you. <laughs> Wait a minute. He's got his doctors. You're going to have to scoot down a couple. That, that's not how it's going to work. Right? Okay, so what is this all about? The end game. The end game. Knowing the end game, knowing what's going on, knowing where we are in relation to those around us, not in judgment, but to be sensitive and aware, because as the body, look, as the body of Christ, you, you, you go to Jesus, you stand before Him, and He pulls out your attendance record, and He sees that you've got gold stars for 67 years. You haven't missed church for 67 years. And yet you did not respond to the needs of the church, the needs of the body, opening yourself up to be used as God would use you within the body. However that would be. Okay? Because not all of you are called to preach. Not all of you are called to teach. We're, we're not all called to the same thing. So where God is calling you in His body will probably be very different, probably be very different than where He's called me. Okay, so you're not going to look at me and, and stand before God and go, well, I, I wasn't as good as Pastor Glenn. My job was this over here and, and, and be ashamed. Because remember, God gave ten talents. He gave five talents. He gave one talent. He gave three talents. He gave two talents. He gave one talent. And, and what happened between the, the, the five and the three or the, the ten and the five? Yeah, the one had less to work with. But he received the same reward. He said, enter into your master's rest. Come into your master's rest. So it's not about quality or quantity. It, it's about steadfastness. It's about being willing to be used as God would choose to use you. And hey, man, if God wants you to clean toilets, clean toilets, man, and sing praise while you're cleaning. Man, if God wants you to, to uh, be an administrator, Man, put that before God and do that to your utmost. Uh, God wants you to be an intercessor, an intercessor, a prayer warrior. Get camel knees. Get on your knees and start praying. When, when, when God is calling you, God has blessed something. God has blessed, God has blessed this church financially. I, I, I look around this church and I can't figure out how this church does the things it does. Other than it's just God being so faithful because you guys are so faithful. Uh, it, it's amazing. Um, but if, if God has called you to a gift of mercy or a gift of giving, man, do it with joy. Do it with all you've got unto Him. Amen? Look at that. I had a message prepared for today. All right.
couple weeks ago, I gave you homework. Does anybody remember what the homework was? What's that? Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Has anybody done the homework? Okay, what I want you to do, I want you to look in Scripture. We are working out of... Um, sorry? Did somebody ask me something? Well, that was weird. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verse 1 through 3, we're, we're looking at the elementary doctrines of the faith. We have looked at um, repentance, we've looked at faith, we've looked at baptism. Next we are looking at laying on of hands. Okay, Scripture tells us that this is an elementary doctrine. This is fundamental. So each of us should know what this is about. That's the whole purpose of this, this message series. Being disciples, we should know the elementary principles. Okay, so laying on of hands. I want you to get into the Word. Find out what the Word has to say about laying on of hands. Okay? Because if you already know when we come together, we'll be on the same page. Maybe. Well, God might give you stuff that, that I haven't got yet. Nowhere, to, anywhere does it say that I'm going to be the fount of all knowledge. All I am is the, the voice. It just gives me to speak and I speak. And I, I, Man, I depend on you guys. Because you have an incredible, the incredible experience in this room and the, the life of Christ is, is awesome. The, the wisdom that God has given the people of this church. And, and you know, I, I look at people and they go, well, you know, I, I, I'm pretty newly saved. I, I look at Dave Burt. He's been a, a believer for about five years now. And I love to hear what God is teaching him, what God is showing him, and, and the excitement that he has in his faith. And, and then we have others in the church that they've been believers for decades. And, and to hear and sit under the wisdom and hear the things that, that the experience and the wisdom that God has given them. Uh, I, honestly, I can't imagine any pastor wanting to go his own and not develop and use that resource. Okay? That's, that's part of being the body. Where I'm lacking, you guys have to step in and, and step up. Okay? So, laying on of hands. Start looking through Scripture. See what Scripture has to say about laying on of hands. And I'll tell you this. It begins way, way back, right at the beginning of the Bible. Okay? And, and it goes into and up to the New Testament. So there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of different components. The scripture says they laid hands. Okay? So we're going to talk about that. Yes, next week. The following week, um, the McDaniels will be in town. And so I've given uh, Kevin the whatever he would like to use of the service that he could share with us what's gone on with the last year the direction they're taking, what's been happening. Um, so two weeks from today, that's the first Sunday in September, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the McDaniels will be here. I would encourage you to be here to hear what he has to share, um, just to, to let him know that we're still supporting him. Um, so next week, laying on of hands. 